Sword of Omens, come to my hand. I, Lion O, command it. Hi, this is Larry Kenny, the voice of Lion O from Thundercats, and you're watching the Dorkening Thundercats. Ho! Well, and then they all, they all obviously know who you are. All right, and there's a spider right there. Fantastic, it's Punk Spider-Man for the Spider-Verse. I love it, uh, excellent. Uh, welcome, everybody. Very excited for this panel, celebrating 60 years of Spider-Man. My name's John Suntress. I host a podcast called War Balloon. It's at warballoon.com, and I've been long associated with Terrific High. And truly, I mean this, one of the great honors is to finally meet and interview some of the creators that we've loved for so many years, and this group of men are certainly part of that uh, group of people that have, it's been great. I've been dying to meet uh, along with the ones that I already met. Well, at least Jared Conway and uh, Dan Jerkins. <laughs> well, we'll do it. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you spoke first, so we'll introduce him first. It's Howard Mackey. Yeah, then we've got Terry Cottonmouth, another baseball player. Wonderful artist and writer, Dan Jurgens. And the dean of this group, and I mean that with all the due respect, the man who killed Gwen Stacy, I'm like, playing him, playing very well. Well, that was a comic book. Yeah, he literally, yeah, sadly, he's still uh, on the lawn, uh, on the lamp. So uh, that's why he moved down to out west and everything. No, he's here. Oh, certainly, is it moving? Yeah. You're, you're awesome. Exactly. I consider myself the luckiest man. Uh, Lou Gehrig reference completely over the heads of our yeah. Thank you, Mark. Absolutely. Guys, um, and truly, I want to go down the line because one of the things I've always loved about Marvel in particular, DC did it with Superman, especially in the more wise years. But I always felt that in that Marvel age of the last 60 years, not only were they telling great stories and an elevated medium, but also reflecting on. Uh, pop culture things of the moment, and I wonder. I mean, really, even you know Howard, even you know going up, and going up into the early aughts and stuff. I'm sure you know Spider-Man was drinking Zima or on a skateboard or something. You know, Spider Man never would. <laughs> Peter Parker, sneaking one for Man Bang and stuff. But yeah, like, are there any weird kind of like cultural moments of you know, of the moment and everything that you pop you popped in the book? I'd like to defer to. <laughs> to, to start with it. Oh yeah, sure. That's okay. Oh no, let's. Okay. Hey man, let's start with a seven. I, I, I think we should try to think. You know what? what, what uh, Doom buggies were a thing, and <laughs> spider buggy. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. So that, uh, that, that was probably a reference. Uh, you know, we were although I don't think they were ever a thing. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it was a moment. You know, we were cease. <laughs> People talking about. Uh, no, I don't. I don't. I, I'm sure there are lots of references in there, but you know, we were swimming in them like fishes in the, in the city, and uh, you, you know, we look back later and say, "Wow, that was really culturally relevant." <laughs> and now it's really dead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, no, it's hard to say. Funny. Dan, do you need anything to come up? No, not really. No, no, no I saw the value. Part of it is, to a certain extent, you try almost to avoid being too on the mark that way. You want to pick something that you know isn't going to be dead in like six months when the book comes out. True. And half yeah. the time you're going to miss on that. So you just kind of try and float around the generalities of it all. Okay. All right. And Terry, is that your answer? It's, it's what he said. I mean, I right. tried to avoid cell phones for a while. Because that wow. might have been a dated thing. Sure. Yeah. So, great. Oh, also, I, I, I'm so pleased I don't write Spider Man comic books yeah. in the age of cell phones because it makes everything way too easy. But to answer your original question, yes, I do have one because it was forced upon me. I will not mention the editor's name, even though he's here sitting two, two uh, seats down from me. You guys can figure it out. It was, it's it, a lot more the NXT. I can say it. <laughs> but we, virtual reality was becoming a thing 
and it is one of my least favorite comics to sign. So please, everybody, go rush out and get a copy of that. Come to my table and <laughs> sign it. There, there is a cover it's got, it's called VR Spider-Man, I, I, I think, and it's, it's literally Spider-Man. I think it was in the, the, um, uh, the you know, the, the hoodie sweatshirt, uh, swinging out at the camera, holding two Uzis. Uh, yeah, uh, no, that, that, they were virtual. That, well, that's it. They were virtual reality, you see. So that made it better. It is really just kind of an, an, amongst many embarrassing points in my, my, my <laughs> right. personal and uh, professional life. I, I it's very, really up there. I sometimes have to say to people, how about if I pay you for me not to sign this one? <laughs> Just buy the comedy from them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I apologize for the sore subject. Yes. Um, and, and also, obviously, the great thing is, and I would imagine, and you guys can correct me, but given the body of work that preceded your runs, all of you, including Jerry, um, the fun is creating new adversaries for Spider-Man, new characters and stuff. So starting with Jerry, I mean, obviously, there's a million that we could mention, and I'm sure we will. But, you know, any, any like, particular one? Well, you don't really want to make that character. I'm so glad it's still around. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, the Punisher is the big one, but uh, I, I really enjoy making characters that were uh, more street level, you know. Okay. And the, the big super power characters that came later. Sure. Uh, Can I trouble you, Jared, to like, get in like that or sure the more? Never sure how close I'm it is. I'm sorry, Danny, you have to share your yeah, exactly. um, You know, characters like Tombstone was, was one of my favorites. Yes. I've ever had. Uh, yeah. Trying to go for the Dick Tracy kind of character. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then there were, you know, misfires like the Grizzly. It's <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> going, you know, from strength to weakness. <laughs> Was the kangaroo yours? Uh, yeah, well, no. <laughs> I'd like to say not. <laughs> oh, we're going to Google that and we'll find out if we get to it. Animal villains became a thing towards the end of Stan's run. And I got to write uh, the second part of the Gibbon story. Uh, because he's, and I asked, how did this come from? This, this character, when Stan went to a zoo. <laughs> and he saw a Gibbon, he thought that would make a cool villain. <laughs> Sometimes you're wrong. <laughs> so yeah, it was a lot of fun to do that. To have to create supporting characters, too. It was always fun. Yeah, Dan? I don't think any of the characters that I really created are being used or anything. Uh, I just, you know, part of it is new characters have to be developed, and I wasn't around long enough to really develop them, so it just didn't take off. How about what he said? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Although okay. Nightwatch was a character I created yes. that I was sort of proud of. He's not really around anymore, and I think a lot of bad right. stuff was done to him along the way after me. But that was when it was uh, Sandstorm, I think, was a villain I created, but it's another version of the Sandman. Sure, just oh, with sure. maybe a better name. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, yeah, really. <laughs> and, and I, uh, well, I run into this situation all the time where I'm contacted by, you know, to do podcasts or back when they were bringing back the uh, 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 Marvel Handbook and say, they contact me and say, hey, Howard, you know, uh, you created such and such character. We want to know what college they went to or what, what their wife's name was. Backstory. Uh, you know, and I said, oh, really? I created that character? <laughs> and so, so I, I literally never remembered. But I think to the, 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 the beginning part of your question, and I think I'm just going to you know, fall down on the sword for Terry and I right now talk about you know, coming in, creating new, new or newish characters after those who went before us, of course, Terry, Terry specifically. Um, <laughs> rolling his eyes, everybody. <laughs> you know, when we were tasked with coming up with... I with trying to avoid the, saying these words. I, 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 I understand that. Yeah. Don't say the name. The, the Clone Saga. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't just blame Jerry. Yeah, he blames me, I blame Jerry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you might as well just blame your parents. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so we were, we were, I mean, because we were tasked with coming up with the next big idea. Sure. I mean, Terry called me and I said, no, Terry, no, don't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that would be horrible. And 
And I said, I don't even remember this story at all. And Terry acted it all out over the phone, which was really embarrassing. And I might have cried a little Yes, he did. It was very moving. He loved the story. And so I said, OK, fine. I think this will be a big misstep, Terry. But that's how the phone saga came to me. So I got to talk first. So I feel better than the love for Ben Riley. Okay. In the last ten years, yes. and, 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 and here, you know, honestly, you did the original, original yes. the like, spider claw, the first thing, it's people coming up to me, talking to me about, like, oh, I love that you created Dan Riley. I'm like, I'm not really sure I did. <laughs> 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 I did an issue with a character that was a clone. That's about it. Can you not just say thank you, Terry? Because Terry, Terry and I have had this discussion. Uh, quite frankly, I said, well, no, you know, he was the inspiration yeah. for what we did. But we, we I mean, to yeah. the rest of your question, we, we did yeah. co-create I'm vegetable. trying to share the credit with you every time. I'm sorry. Well, when, when, you, when you say credit, you mean blame? Well, <laughs> yeah. That really, that process of me trying yeah. to share with you was when I was getting blamed. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm continuing it into now that the character is coming to its own again. But I keep saying that you want to forget that. Right. Yes, it's yes. right. It, was, it definitely was the answer. And how it says, yeah, just forget it. Yeah, I mean, Jerry Boo, I said Jerry Boo. Somebody asked me, where did you come up with, why did you come up with, or, you know, the, the difficult, why did you, or how did you come up with the idea of and I said, well, I was trying to solve a story problem. That was it, you know. I right. had a story where I had to bring back Gwen Stacy. I didn't want to bring back Gwen Stacy, so we created this clone thing. And then I thought, well, you got to finish that off somehow. And finish it off with Spider-Man fighting his clone. 100%. That was it. That was it. That was it. <laughs> now, what, would, what resonated with me at the time was it was two good people in a bad situation. So right. he was a clone of Spider-Man. That's what I remember as a kid thinking was so interesting. And the ambiguity at the end left it open for us later on when I have a little different memory of Hat than Howard does. <laughs> He's old, so take everything with a He's older. Uh, but Howard seems to recall that we were tasked with coming up with something in response to the death of Superman. Yeah. Which I don't really remember. To me, it was that we were in this situation where we had aged Peter Parker. We had married him. He had a great job. He lived in a penthouse apartment. His problem was now paying the mortgage instead of doing his homework and all the stuff that we wanted yeah. our audience to be able to identify with. And that is what led me to remember that story and the ambiguity of that and say, oh, well, maybe we can organically. We didn't want to have Peter and Mary Jane get divorced because that would be more baggage on top. Right. But it was, like you just said, it was solving a story problem. And right. in this case, it was a character problem. And our, just so you know, our two memories are not mutually exclusive. Uh, I think it will both those things. No, hey. well, no one told me we were addressing that. Well, no, we got to talk to you about that. Right, so, yeah. Uh, and also, okay. not, not just Jerry's original story, but I remember in the original run of What If that they, they re-examined it, and uh, the, you know, the clone thinking he was the original kind of put uh, Peter in stasis, and he took over until he did, and then it was all solved with one issue. But I, no, really, man. I mean, and also. That was all one inch man. We trying to get out here. Yeah. 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 So. <laughs> hey, man. And a lot of men I know is editorial saying, you know, hey, let's keep milk for the cow. And it's like, how's it going to run out of milk? Yeah. That and I, keep milk I, milk. I have the original notes for the clone side of the first meeting. And I still have the, the notebook. Mm -hmm. And we had mapped it out for. Uh, three months the story was set because we had four titles right and we thought four titles 12 three issues. months that's 12 issues that's a solid year's worth of stories Absolutely. and we got towards that last month that marketing had taken over marvel and said oh no this is doing well keep going <laughs> i remember saying at one point to someone, did you know how story uh works if there's a beginning a middle and guess what happens there's an end and, and we were so the marketing department did not know how story no they did not yeah that was foolish i think you were bad you tried that no i get it absolutely and this is why i love television like well they'll be like no we have a six episode story that's it and i love the original life on mars from british tv and i even on the commentaries one of the producers like Listen, we're not going to do quantum leap. The guy's in a coma. He can't be in a five-year coma. Right? Yeah, I love quantum. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so no. I, and I and I also think that thankfully 
because of the, and again, no fault of you guys, but the mistakes in marketing of milking an event too far, I think they've wised up and, you know, five issues, not even six issues anymore, five issues. Yeah. Well, let's move on to happy issues. Oh, yes, thank Give God. me a story, I'll start with Howard and move down, but give me your favorite character, villain, uh, you know, uh, supporting character, whatever. Who was your, beyond Peter himself, who did you enjoy writing? Well, I, 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 as a matter of fact, today it came up several times uh, at my table. Several, several fans came up with uh, uh, Spider-Man number seventy-five that that I wrote, and it was it was the conclusion of a a, a, a confrontation between Norman Osborn and and Peter. And just to to note, prior to that, I was I was in an editorial meeting with the editor chief and. Um, and the editor and I did. When bringing Norman back was brought up, I said, "Absolutely not. This is, you know, of, you know, aside from Mary Jane, <laughs> this is a death that should never." What's that? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, Gwen. I, yeah, thank you. Yes, aside from the death of Gwen, this is a death that should matter. Matter. And bringing him back undoes that. And I was overruled. <laughs> so I either. I was going to write Norman into the book, or it's going to stop writing a book. And I decided to try, and I wound up loving uh, writing uh, Norman. My approach to it was that this was never going to be about uh, Spider-Man and, and and the Green Goblin. This was about exploring the relationship between uh, Peter and Norman, and the, this kind of odd, twisted uh, father-son relationship sure. that they had, and. It, it's all, especially since it came towards the end of the Clone Saga, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I sometimes have trouble going back and looking at my own work from a certain period, or looking at my own work at, at, at all, but I, I'm actually, after talking to several fans, I don't know if they're here today, or uh, uh, tonight or not, I, I, I think I'm going to go back and reread that issue, because it seems to have had an impact on a lot of people. So, there you go. Yeah. How about it, sir? Uh, for me, it probably was Ben Riley because sure. you had given us a blank slate, or effectively a blank slate, but we knew certain aspects. We knew to be limits, whatever Peter Parker's were, and but he had lived a different life by the time we revisited the character. So we could use that to explore and alter Peter Parker, sort of. And the fun for me was the collaborative aspect of it. Of we were all creating this character together, and it was the artists and the writers, and it was a group of us. And it was an excuse to talk to Howard on the phone at two thirty in the morning. Yes, because we time. need that excuse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about it, Dan? Uh, I was also going to say, Ben, um, mostly just because by the time I got involved with that, uh, I think the books had really strayed quite a bit from what the dictates of Spider-Man were, and that's why they wanted to bring in Ben Riley because you know Peter Parker was probably never. Uh, the type of person slated to marry a supermodel. I mean, if you're fighting a villain and, and your biggest problem is getting Aunt May's prescription home to her because you have a jam in your hip pocket or whatever, uh, you know, ending up with Christy Brinkley probably wasn't where the Spider-Man story was supposed to go. So to be able to write Ben, which was free of all of that baggage, I thought was sure. a lot of fun. It, I had a good time with it for six months until I didn't, and rather do what they said, I said, I'll see you later. And other things to go do. Understood. Yeah. Absolutely. Favorite character here? Uh, well, I guess Mary Jane was my favorite <laughs> supporting character to write. Uh, but the most fun character to write was J. Jonah Jameson. <laughs> Just, you, you could never go too far with the change <laughs> Yeah. And at the same time, there was an interesting subtext to him that, uh, you know, I'd like to. Like to at least recognize you know, that, that, that on some level he wanted to be, you know, a, a good uh, journalist, but he just could not help himself in <laughs> <laughs> this one uh, maybe. So yeah, those were, I think, the, the main characters. That That's awesome. I feel like I'm doing a 12-step program for the Spider Clones. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there's, you know, it's like a kid when uh, Cap and uh, Jim Starlin are in that group and everything. I'm down. Like, I'm like, um, please, I'm going to open it to questions, so I, I, hope, I hope there are. Sir, right away. Yeah, um, so Howard, you mentioned that the Clone Saga was supposed to be, I guess, th three, three months? months? Years of stories. I remember five months, but he has the notes. I have the notes. Um, <laughs> and it was that whole three months, four months, 12 issues. 
Yeah. When, when I guess marketing decided to expand it, is that when is that when Dan was brought in? Like, was Dan always a part yeah. of it, or was when, that when just a start? chance? Yeah. After summer, I summer of '95, somewhere in there. Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. So, yeah, you guys were already into the store. Yeah. When when I came in, uh, it was already treading water. I think. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember the exact timing, but it would have been whenever, when did, when did we launch? Well, I do know this. I do know this. When I came in, it was, this is all going to end in six months. <laughs> That's what I was told, yeah. is, is, is that we had six months, we're, and we're going to wind it down, and Peter was going to die, and Ben Riley was going to die. So, right. what's the plan? Yeah. Yes. And, wow. I don't, I, I. I may even have finance. Yeah. So, uh, but that's that's what the plan was for at least a bit. Yeah. I just don't know how that relates to when you guys start. Yeah. I. I I'm sorry. I. I barely remember the characters that I wrote. <laughs> Actually, I, when we originally started, I think the end game was supposed to be that Peter was going to go off into the sunset with Mary Jane, yes. and she was going to be pregnant. So right. he was going to recognize that with great power comes great responsibility, and now it was to his okay. wife and child, so that he could have a happy ending as well, and we wouldn't further piss off the fans that were all about Peter Parker. But I think you came on after I was off the book, so it might have already graduated to Peter dying. I think it did. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say, too, um, I was a huge fan of that sensational Spider-Man that launched into you, and it's a well, shame that man. you never got to finish uh, the story there. Maybe at some point you will. Never know. <laughs> never say never. Okay, that's awesome, sir. Thank uh, you. So, Jerry, I know you've been asked this a million times. Gwen states just just a couple of follow-ups. Um, you know, there's always speculation. Stanley was in Europe, and you know, was was this really um, really coming from you? Did uh, in hindsight? Did you Wish you didn't have that arc of 121, 122, and in hindsight, and, and did you think that you would kind of have that whole backlash 50 years later for people like me here at the Comic Con? Well, I mean, uh, the, the reality is Stan was involved. Um, the premise of killing off a supporting character was, uh, came from John Demita, who was the lead on the book uh, until he left as pencil. Uh, his his thought I mean his thought was going to uh, you know his, his particular background was an interest in newspaper strips and he loved Terry and the Pirates and he was always saying that, that, that the storytelling in that was terrific and one of the ways that they would re-engage readers from time to time was to have a, a, a character uh, die that would remind the readers that yeah this is a where things happen, you know, and you should follow it. Uh, so his thought was, let's go off on a supporting character, and his idea was Aunt May. And at that time, I, I felt Aunt May was still extremely valuable to the book for story reasons and also thematically. But I had never liked Gwen Stacy. Mary Jane walked into you know, the Face and Tiger, you hit the jackpot. That I would, I was sold. That was the character I wanted to write, and I sort of there was no really. I defy anybody to def, to define Gwen Stacy prior to her death. <laughs> she became important because she was dead. You like to be her important. Um, but Mary Jane had a fully developed personality that was interesting, and I thought she would be a much more fun character to write. So we pitched this idea to Stan and Roy, who was editor in chief. And Stan said, sure, fine. You know, Stan, Stan's attitude once he left the book was he didn't give a crap. <laughs> but he wanted you to keep doing good stories, but he had no personal investment in this character, that character, except for the main character of the story. But when the book came out and there was feedback. Uh, at the college campuses where he was going to give speeches, uh, and all they would ask him was, why did you kill Glenn Stacy? He started to claim that he had been somewhere else. <laughs> 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 the, the idea that we would do something like that on the same title book uh, and not ask the publisher <laughs> if it was okay, it's ludicrous, but Stan sold that idea, and that's where that comes from. Uh, 
I really liked doing those two stories. I think we really nailed them. Uh, I liked doing them at the time. Uh, I was proud of them. And uh, I was heavily traumatized by the, um, the, uh, the convention uh, uh, pushback you know, that, that I received. I was a kid, you know, I was like 20, 21 years old, so uh, it, it hit me kind of hard. And, uh, I withdrew from it from, and didn't really regret it so much as I really didn't enjoy the, the feedback. But now, 50 years later, people are still talking about it. I'm, I can, I'm even more proud. So, absolutely. Go back to questions. I always tell Jerry this. I was nine and I read Death and Point Stacy at Marvel Tales. And I didn't go postal. It did make me, you know, go to Bell Tower and start shooting. And I, all it did was explode my imagination. And it was like, wow, there are consequences in a story. And truly, man, that's probably one of the earliest comics. I was too young to read Tower uh, comics with the um, the characters of Wally, one of those guys, Thunder Agents, and they killed off one of the heroes in that. Uh, this was the first one, and it's like, <laughs> and it really, and to this day, I think it's one of the most, obviously, the most powerful stories of Spider Man's so Just that fist of revenge and everything in Peter, when, and also that crack. And I even asked Jerry, and I'll real fast before we go back to questions, what, for the audience's purpose, the crack, like, did Peter's web? Catching Gwen, did that cause her to break the neck? Was she already dead when Peter tried to grab her? What was your thought? Well, it's, a, it's, it's sort of interesting. This is one of those cases where you can you have a really collaborative, creative moment because I have written an outline that I gave to Kill Kane, and in it I, I sort of whiffed on uh, you know, the cause of death by saying by the, the, the classic cliche, you know, the fall killer, you know. Um, and Gil turn pencils that clearly show Mary Jane getting whiplash. That's next thing going on. And when I saw that, I thought, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And I put in the sound effect. Um, now, it's kind of ambiguous. Was she dead when she, when she was tossed? Uh, was she, did the, the, the uh, neck crack? Yep. I, you know, for a long time I wished on that too, and I, but I do think that, that uh, Spidey's actually killed her. Wow. Um, but that was, that, that was an attempt to grow towards realism, you know, which is that heroes are, are heroes don't always succeed. Right. And the, act, the, the true measure of a hero is what do you do after you fail, you know, and, uh, you know, so you're always winning. You really never challenged, but when you when you're defeated in such a such a massive way and through your own actions, I think that speaks more to your blow up qualities. All right, thanks. Questions. I'm sorry. I, I wanna, I'll get back to you guys. But uh, yes, sir. You. Yes, uh, I have a question for Terry. You mentioned earlier how a lot of the genesis for the Clone Saga was uh, the writers writing a little bit too much of their personal lives into the character of Spider-Man. I'm wondering, on the flip side of that, is there a character that you really felt like resonated with you that you could really just write in a way where you put yourself in it in a way that was really positive? Uh, the short answer is I don't think so because I don't fight crime. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't, I, I really don't, I, I can't think of any, I, on some level Peter Parker was someone because we all have certain questions about our identity and, and guilt. We all have certain guilt by some point in our lives. So I think maybe Peter Parker would have been the closest. Big fan. <laughs> cool. Uh, sir, with the glasses, yeah. Do you have glasses? No, you don't have glasses, excuse me. I have glasses. I can't see. I appreciate that. Um, I think it was a gentleman earlier today, yesterday, and there's a couple of questions I've had on my mind from a long way to ask. But, Getting more love these days from certain storylines more than 10, 20 years later, and even reading the comics these days, a lot of writers you can tell have read a lot of that stuff. Is that a good, positive feeling when you hear this from other fans? Is it a good thing for you thinking actually that's going to have been a nice What are your thoughts on that? Remember? Of course. No. <laughs> yeah, you haven't said anything a lot since. Um, you know, I, if I understand your question correctly, I think that any time you have a story that is fondly remembered, 
uh, it's always flattering because the, the whole idea is if you walk into your comic store every single week and you see how many new books come out on a weekly basis, and then you multiply that times 52 weeks a year times how many years, when your work is remembered and, and portions of it are, you know, stay in print or are just brought up to you, I think it's always flattering. And, and especially sometimes if it's the stuff that you kind of almost thought was forgotten, because I, I don't know necessarily where all of you, I know where you did that work-wise, but you know, there was a time when your book came out and it was never collected as a trade paperback or a hardcover or anything else. It, yep. it lived on the stands for that one week probably, and that was it with no thought it would be reprinted or seen again. Any other thoughts, guys? For me, it probably was the Clone Saga because I was so vilified and took so much crap about that. <laughs> no, that that's been besides me. <laughs> the other people. Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. <laughs> oh, like, vilified. I had to change my identity. Oh, okay. and it wait. Me. No one told me this was Therapy 101. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> couple Catholic. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, but when it turned around, when you had the kids who grew up with uh, Ben Riley as their Spider-Man, and suddenly it was a popular storyline, and they come up to you at conventions and say, this was the Spider-Man I knew, and then they even revisited in Marvel Comics, and they made him into a hero and brought him back, that yeah. was rewarding. Yeah. I, I have to. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that, that, that is it. The, the payoff for us, for the club side, has come 20 some odd years later, yeah. because, and that's what I say, there, I, get, I get a, a, a lot of younger fans, Yes, and quite frankly at my age everybody's a younger fan, um, <laughs> who come up and say exactly that. Ben Riley was my Spider-Man, and, and that was the intent of the story. The intent was to, we were trying to write a story to the next generation yeah. of Spider-Man, potential Spider-Man fans, and it did, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. I mean, and that was really what, that. and that was your, and, and I'm, I'm going to stop joking around, but that, that was, that was your vision for what we were trying to do then, to, you know, unencumber Spider-Man and to give the fans, not, not the, not necessarily the readers who had been reading since Stan was writing it, but give the, the newer, yes. younger fans an opportunity to jump on board. And that's so, and that, that, that was your, I do give you the credit for that. Please stop mm -hmm. joking around, it's making me uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, 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 and I brought up comic book deaths, and like, we, like again, yeah, some of the readers, uh, we all roll our eyes, but it's like, no, for a kid, this could be the first time they ever saw someone, right. and it's a big area, the kid is not upset, he agrees with me, that's good. And truly, man, and that's great, and truly, you know, next generation of Star Trek, they all got crap, it's not Kurt Spock, uh, it happens, and certainly, also in the Zeitgeist case, not only Ben Riley, but Kyle Rayner and Connor Hawk at DC, legacy characters and stuff, you gotta freshen up every now and then, and also not take for granted the new readers that have been around for, you know, 20 plus years or whatever. Uh, sir, yes sir. Hey guys, long time listener, first, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> so, That's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you might listen to work, but when it's possible. So, yeah. with all the Spider-Man that you guys have written, is there anything that you ever got in an issue or in a story that you're like, I can't believe they let me put that in? Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. Not that we're going to admit. <laughs> <laughs> it's statute of limitations. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 no, I can't think of anything in a Spider-Man story. I, I have done it elsewhere, and I, again, I'm not admitting to it. <laughs> not in public, because I think Tom DeFalco would still come after me. <laughs> he's, my, he's my boss at the time. But, uh, no, I mean, truthfully, I, I did also try to be, I mean, we, uh, how many of us were editors? You and I were editor, James and Jerry was a long time editor. Um, I tried to be very, uh, I, I was taught early on to be protective of the characters and of the audience that we had. So sometimes there, there, were, there would be people who did try to sneak things in. I, I don't know that it was always the writer necessarily. I, we had some letters try to get things in and uh, uh, artists put sure. things in the background, yeah. things like that. But I, I still always had that, that editorial hat 
on the back of my head at least, and say, oh, you know, we, you know, because honestly, I was always thinking of it as uh, this. This was we were writing the material for a younger audience too, and I wanted to be very respectful of that. And I also didn't want it to get caught in for me to get fired. Because that's what I did once. <laughs> so, hilarious. Well, you're up front here, and please promote your podcast. Oh, sure. So, Mark Janakio from Amazing Spider Talk. I've harassed most of you this weekend already. Um, <laughs> uh, we had a conversation a while ago with Ron Friends, and he had mentioned that he connected with Spider Man as a character so much that, like, he and DeFalco, when they were working out, they would refer to him as Pete, you know, as if like he was one of the guys. So, like, for, for each of you or whoever wants to chime in, what is it about Peter, Spider Man, that you find so relatable like what what is it about this character that just makes you connect to him in such a unique way that you would consider him a friend of us I, I i found that when i was writing spider-man and this was a, a a problem for me for a while and i think the at one point uh because i i was i, I took on too much work at one point too early in my career and at one point i was writing um spider-man it was well um, and I, I had just, Ghost Rider had just taken off, so I had the character Dan Catch. And then I was doing something for Terry, a, a Havoc. Marvel Comics. Presents. Marvel Comics Presents. With, 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 yeah. with, with wow. Havoc. And I remember at one and point. The Ghost Rider there as well. Yeah, well, yeah, the, 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 Dan Catch. Ghost Rider. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then I, I got the books in, um, you know, and I, I, I just, and I rarely reread my work after it's printed. And I read them and I realized suddenly, uh, Peter, Dan, and Havoc, Alex Summers, all sounded the same, mm -hmm. and they sounded like me. Because I they're the same. same. Yeah, and I, I, I yeah, and I, I realized, and that that's not a good thing for a writer. Uh, and they all they all had my voice, and I think honestly, as much as there's a lot of Dan Ketch in, you know, there's a lot of me and Dan Ketch. I identified more to. Not necessarily Peter's voice, but Spider-Man's voice, the, the kind of rapid, just, you know, insult your friends and, uh, and your enemies alike. Um, and so what I did was I quit Web of Spider-Man. That, that's why I left Web of Spider-Man. And of course, six months later, I got a phone call from uh, Danny Finger, who was the editor, saying, hey, Howard, you know, uh, Todd McFarlane's off adjective list Spider-Man. Do you want to uh, take that on? And I said, did, did, did you think the problem was the adjective? <laughs> and then, of course, I took it. But I had, I think I felt a little bit more confident in my ability to discern and separate the voices a little bit at, at that time. I, I remember that conversation yeah. with you and it. And it was very real for you. Oh, yeah. It was disturbing for me because after that, every time I read those characters, I heard them in a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to read your voice. That me up for a while. I have not had my Brooklyn accent in many, many years. <laughs> uh, when, when, when I was writing Spider-Man, uh, I was literally the same age as Peter Parker, so at least the first run. So his problems were my problems. I, I didn't have a girlfriend fall off a bridge, but <laughs> <laughs> all the same issues about apartments, about uh, jobs, and security, about sick parents, I mean, everything was being a partner. So I had grown up with the character. Uh, like, the first issue came out around the same time that I started reading Marvel, so I was like, very much, that voice was my voice, and vice versa, so I had really identified Peter. Any thoughts, Dan? Or? No, no, I, I just okay. think it is, and Jerry touched on it, I think it's about the struggle, because that's what life is for most people. And it's it's the relate, the, I, I joked earlier about Spider-Man having to get a bottle of medicine or pills or whatever home to Aunt May, because he was fighting the Green Goblin, but that's everyone's struggle, right? And I think that's what made Marvel characters yeah, it's, it's, it's what made Marvel characters so much different from DC characters at that time. And it's what made Peter, uh, I think, that magnet of all those characters is that for him it was much more demonstrative than most. Got it? Absolutely. Uh, the gentleman holding a camera that's got to say hi. Yes, sir. Who was your favorite guest character, Ryan? Good question. 
book. Your, your favorite guest star in your book. So, guest hero, I'm assuming, or anything? Guest hero. Guest hero. Ooh, I like this. Stumped, you've stumped the battle, so you can leave a lot of money to I caught Spider-Man on and off for about 10 years, I realized. And so in that time, I, I did a lot of guest appearances. And I'm trying to, I mean, I, 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 I think it's the only time I got to write Daredevil. Oh. And so that was, that was fun for me. You know, was, yeah, I, I kind of, one likes what Jerry was saying, I always, preferred the more street level uh, sure. villains. I, I always thought it was a problem as we, we got Spider-Man going up against bigger and stronger characters, then, you know, that meant you couldn't have him go back. How does he face off against Galactus and then, then go up against the Kingpin? And, sure. and, 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 so whenever possible, I tried to, to feature those kind of characters. So I'm going to go with, if we're going to be hero, it would definitely be uh, Daredevil, but then I also loved being able to you know, grab a hold of some of the villains too. And I, I got to write the trapster, who I still think is the case. I just had a blast doing that, you know, just trying to find something new uh, with the character to bring them to a different level. So, uh, for me, it might have been Iron Fist. Cool. I uh, guess I did a Spider-Man couple of issues that I did. Um, and I, I can't really explain why. I didn't particularly identify with Danny Rand or Iron Fist, but it came from a period of my fandom that I really appreciated and enjoyed. So it was, it was a privilege for me to be able to, to write him into a story. Uh, for me, it was uh, Johnny Storm because he had been here at least at that early stage where like these these bros who had this rivalry friendship and they were kind of dicks to each other. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that, that reminded me of the friends that I have in business. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, I grew with some of them, but you know, yeah. it was a lot of fun. You know, I mean, that, that kind of camaraderie uh, worked sort of workplace camaraderie and, and uh, uh, just male rivalry at the start. Awesome. Dan, did Danny ever favorite guest star? Well, you know, I would have only find it as a reader uh, because I don't think I wrote any guest stars for uh, my very limited run. Um, and it would, I always did get a kick out of the Johnny Storm issues and I always thought there was something sort of magic about Spider-Man and Captain America in this yes, yes, together. Yes. Because their Spider-Man became somewhat deferential, I think, to Captain. Hundred kind percent. Of, that was always kind of cool. Yes, absolutely. Did did Spidey make it in your cap run? No, he did not. Okay. No. Because I love and, and Jerry got it. Were you the first to put Johnny and the Peter together? No, I th they, they were actually uh, that, that actually goes back to uh, FF, uh, I mean, to Spider-Man number one. No, yes, when Spider-Man uh, was yeah, on join. Yeah. yeah. Then it just sort of sort of happened. The first time that I actually got to write Spider-Man was a Marvel team-up. And I think one of the early, I think the original premise was with Spider-Man and the Torch. Wow. So, uh, you know, this is going to be an ongoing thing. Right. The first two, three issues. And I just like that. Absolutely, but no, and I, as subsequent creators, have put Johnny and Peter together to deliver a guess. Um, we've seen, there's been a bunch of live action movies. What's a villain uh, that y'all wrote that has been a live action that y'all would love to see at that? Ooh, villain that you wrote that you'd like to see in a live action movie? Me personally, I'd like to see Jumpstone. Mm -hmm. Oh! <laughs> and, uh, I believe in the Miles Morales sequel. Tombstone's going to be in, I believe. Which one? They're making a second uh, into the Spider Verse with Miles, and I heard Tombstone's in. Yeah, sadly not live action, but at least he's, you know, and those, hey man, the first, you know, the first cartoon would be won an Oscar. So, you know, Dan, any, any uh, villains you want to see? No, because I, I always thought uh, Mysterio would be great, and they finally got around to it, so that worked out. Yes, it did. Absolutely. Terry? I can't think of one in particular. Oh, yes. Of course. I, I'd love to see the Clone Saga story. Uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Oh, <laughs> no, no, wait, we want it featuring yeah. HIV the and the Japanese. Japanese. Sure. So, sure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right, Spider Punk, you've got a question. Uh, um, if you had full creative freedom, uh, you know, could have Spider Man do whatever you want, what story would you tell? I love the part, and forgive me, but I love that uh, there's a woman that made Spider Man. That's fantastic. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> You never get full creative freedom <laughs> for, for a, a, a big corporation like uh, Marvel is attached to you. Um, I, I got, I got nothing. <laughs> I, I would retell the Clone Saga. No, <laughs> we were supposed to do it in the first place. That's what I would do. But he's, yeah. uh, when I was doing the book, um, if you all remember the the burglar, uh, that is quite integral to Spider-Man's story um, that killed Uncle Ben. I introduced the daughter for him, and I always had some places I wanted to take that particular combination uh, that is still sitting in my folder of untold stories, and then I like to play around with that one. Mm -hmm. uh, please, with the, yeah, the Neil Gaiman here, please. That's you, sir, the, the brunette with the big hair. That's you. So, uh, Spider-Man's from one universe to the other, you know, like, the, well, like, like, Miles being from the Ultimate Universe, that kind of thing? Yeah, kind of, yeah. And now, so, can you, can you repeat, you guys, did you hear the question? So, if you can speak up a little bit about it, buddy. Okay, how, how, how would you guys differentiate your Spider-Man from versions from the past and then also including the cartoons and the movies? Is there, do you feel there's a difference in terms of writing? I think it's natural. It just, it happens when you have a, 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 a different writer stepping to the, the keyboard, your, your in, the interior voice coming through the, the character is just going to make them different automatically. My version of Spider-Man is definitely going to be different than, than Terry's, than, than, than Dan's, or than Jerry's. And it's important to, I, I, I had a, a my, my take on continuity, and a lot of that comes from that everything that's come from the past, was to be very aware of the continuity, but not to be a slave to it. And if I, if, if I spent my time writing my Spider-Man stories and trying to create the voice of Stan, or, or Jerry, or whoever did it before me, it just, it was, it would, I believe, fall flat, and I would still be at the keyboard on the first issue, because I would never have gotten it right. So that, that was, that was my approach. That said, though, our job was to not differentiate our version of Spider-Man from the previous one. Consistency. Yes. To keep it going, but it, it would be a natural, it's going to happen yeah. anyway. And when it comes to the uh, the cartoons and the movies and the TV shows, I think they do a pretty good job of capturing the, the core of Spider-Man that I think of as being the core of Spider-Man. I can't speak to these guys. Great, Jim. When you when you took over, it was kind of recent to Stan's run. Exactly. Well, then, <laughs> so was there an edict to maintain well, the place? I, I think it was understood, you know, that that. It shouldn't feel like a totally different book, you know. Sure. As I, as I said, I was sort of uh, being mentored by John Romita uh, during that period, and but you know, my voice is my voice. Sure. It's, it's just going to happen. I loved writing Spider-Man because I could hear how that character would talk, but what my word choices and my facing of that is going to be different from Stan's. Absolutely. Know? Uh, but I tried to try to make it seem like it was Stan. Uh, yes, sir. I want this for Jerry. I wanted to ask, you know, as you've lived another life as a screenwriter for TV and Law and Order, yeah. all that stuff. Did you ever have any situations where they would, someone would learn about your background as a writer for Spider-Man, and they would react in certain ways, or then they want to ask you questions like? What really happened with Gwen well, and things it, like that? It's it sort of I, I, I had a I had a, 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 a twenty odd year career of doing uh, uh, TV 
TV film and then TV. Uh, and when Roy Thomas and I started out writing films back in the late 70s, we had to hide the fact that we had written comic books, or at least downplay it enough so that they didn't think we were idiots, you know, incapable of writing serious stuff. Um, and then by the end of my career, it became exactly that, you know, where, oh, you wrote, yeah, do you know Stan Lee? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it was a weird contextual period, you know, because originally the people that I worked for uh, had grown up thinking of comic books as junk. And then by the time I was ending my career, the people that I worked for had grown up reading my comics. So it was a very different environment. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, it was just more like conversation, you know. Uh, just, do you, and most of it was, did you, do you know Stan? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Dan, if you want to add to that or no. no. Okay, uh, Jerry, I want to follow up on that because when you uh, came back to comics, after writing so much TV and film, did, did you take any storytelling skills that you had learned from TV oh, and film? Sure, sure. Because yeah. I mean, it is, it's a pleasure to read your current stuff as well as the, the classic stuff, and also watch your TV and films. I think I was. I think I, I learned to be a much better uh, structuralist, you know, in, in, in writing TV because it's very structured. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think I also. Well, because comics in general had, had become less bombastic, you know, my writing is much, much less bombastic than it was when I was writing uh, in the early 70s. Sure, but everybody had to shout at the top of their Absolutely, yeah. All the equivalents had to see what you said. Yeah, we had to more conversation, you know. Absolutely. To get something that, uh, you know, I had to be trained in, in writing totally. Natural dialogue, absolutely. No, I can see that. All right, we have time only for one more question. And, uh, all right, yeah, actually, I'm going to give it to the, I'm going to give it to a kid. Fine, yeah, I'm sorry. But you know, seriously, go up to the tables. They're all going to be here all weekend. So seriously, I'm so sorry. And I, we're running out of time. I apologize. Yeah? It's more specific than your career, but um, you talked a little bit at the beginning about Mary Jane Watson, and she's my favorite Marvel character. A lot of that's because of the stuff you did at her. And I wanted to ask, what drew you Because she had a big time for her family, so well, I mean, I, 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 very superficially, it was the, the, her introduction by John Lemieux, you know, that, that classic picture. But I also just felt that she, that she as a uh, as a character, had this this dual aspect similar to Peter's, you know, which was the presentation that she made to the world as Mary Jane, uh, is similar to Peter's presentation as Spider. -Man. You know, very much a uh, high energy, high vibration personality. And just judging by the women that I had known, the girls, my teenage, because I was barely uh, teenage years, uh, I knew that those girls who presented that way were actually, you know, either shy or had some uh, interior stuff going on that made them have to perform. And I thought that was a cool duality to her that would work well with Peter. Uh, when was just too well adjusted, you know. <laughs> she just seemed like a happy woman who had no problems, uh, which is not an interesting character to write. Uh, but Mary Jane, you know, there was this hint that there was something wrong. Yeah. And I thought, eventually, I, I wrote a graphic novel which I with her a lot in which we got into the whole, what was wrong. <laughs> it was a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, real fast, quick comment. The reason why we're all here is because of the body of work these people have done. And Dan always quite out was a very brief sp sp spider clone that would run, but his body of work in the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe speaks for itself. And I'm so sorry we could be able to get to all the questions. Obviously, they're at the tables. They're here all weekend. I urge you to go up and, and talk to them. But I will thank you for the audience and sure they'll agree. For the body of work of the
Donald does. And it and also uh, I just reposted an amazing conversation with Jerry and with Brent that is comparing characters and stuff on my working podcast. So uh, you'll forgive the plug, but it's a great conversation. I'm not even